Lily. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, well, I'd like to just exchange the thanks and thank the family and Hugo and Lou and every everyone else and the team for inviting me to come to speak tonight. It's great to be here, and um, I'm really shocked at how many people are out on a cold, rainy Tuesday evening to hear about stock options. Um, it might not be the most uh, sort of fashionable or uh, sexy topic, but hopefully uh, you can leave uh, enlightened. Because, I mean, Lou started off asking, like, hands up for founders, and I saw probably the majority of the room go up. Is there anybody here who's a startup employee or thinking of being a startup employee? Yeah, there's another contingent. Probably accounts for 90% of the room between you. So obviously, stock options are uh, uh, close to the heart if you're a founder, because you know that they're super important for helping you to hire and retain the best team possible, which you're going to need to succeed in growing your business. And if you're a startup employee, they're obviously very close to your heart as well, because it's they're probably one of the um, principal reasons why you chose to join a startup. Um, and, you know, being frank, you hope to make a decent amount of money out of them at some point in the future. Um, <clears throat> so, but the, the issue is that in Europe, we're still finding our feet in terms of how to leverage employee stock options. You know, we don't exactly know how many we should give to each particular person in a particular role or the given stage, um, and uh, what those might be worth in the future if you're an employee or what terms to wrap around those options. So there's a real, there's a real sort of lack of, uh, of knowledge there. Um, so I'm hoping that you, you leave tonight knowing considerably more uh, or at least having some of those questions answered. Um, and as Lou said, um, there's a book which uh, I wrote um, on, with Index uh, on, over, uh, on the whole topic. So it's 150 pages on stock options. So if after reading that you still got questions, then I, I, I'll, I'll do my best to help over email, but um, I'm not sure how much more. There's a lot of detail in there. And there's also a, a software app that I sort of built, and I'll, I'll give a little demo at the end uh, on that to help you design a, a stock option plan as well. Um, so there's all that. But you might wonder why somebody from a, from a VC firm is, is standing in front of you talking about stock options. Um, but well, I'd say that you know we're really passionate about them at, at Index, and we're real evangelists for um, how critical and ingredient uh, effective use of stock options are for building uh, a successful tech ecosystem. That's how you suck and draw talent into a startup ecosystem, and people who then spin out of exited startups, feeling positive, spreading the word, evangelizing to other talented individuals, and drawing in talent, which is the fuel for any positive uh, startup ecosystem. So we've seen that play out, and we feel like there's still a lot of long way to go in Europe on this topic. In fact, we feel like Europe's had fantastic success, and you know, Index has been around for 22 years now, so we've been there since the real beginning of any sort of tech scene um, uh, in Europe. And we've seen sort of really positive, we've seen us break through the unicorn barrier with Skype uh, back in 2005, which we were an investor in. We've seen a breakthrough more recently, the $10 billion barrier with Supercell, which we are also invested in, Zalando's market caps over 10 billion. But are we going to see a, a Google or an Alphabet or a Facebook in Europe? And we actually feel like broadening employee ownership is actually a critical ingredient to achieving that for Europe. So we think it's that important. Um, I'll say a few words about index. I don't know how many of you know something about index, but I'll uh, if hands up if you know something about it. Okay. Well, we're, as I just said, we're a 22-year-old um, VC fund. We were born in Europe, in Geneva, in fact. Strange place to be, but we're now basically, our, our main investing offices are London and San Francisco. Uh, our portfolio is 160 companies spread equally between the US and Europe. Um, exited companies that we backed include, I mentioned Skype, MySQL, ASOS, Betfair, uh, Criteo, Just Eat in Europe, in the US, Zendesk, Etsy, um, uh, Pure Storage, Arista, so um, Climate Corp. In the current portfolio in Europe, we have Deliveroo, Farfetch, Funding Circle, um, um, uh, Adyen, um, TransferWise, so a lot of sort of unicorns in Europe. In the US, that's Slack, Dropbox, Sonos, Robinhood. Um, so we've, we've got a very strong portfolio, 
and we've had that opportunity to learn from both the US and Europe sort of uniquely. We're a single investing team uh, across both geographies. It's a one fund uh, philosophy. Uh, I've been at Index five and a half years, always in a portfolio facing role. Uh, the last two and a bit years exclusively on talent. So I support our companies on all things talent, um, which can be around uh, sort of leadership team hiring and um, internal recruiting capability. It can be on org design. It can be on compensation, on other aspects of HR. And one of the questions which comes up repeatedly when I'm speaking with our founders is, what do I do about my stock option plan? Yeah. How much, or I'm hiring this person, they're, ex they're asking for this much. Is it right? It's really way out of line with what the rest of the team's got. What should I do? These questions kept on coming up. So I started building a sort of data set of um, uh, both quantitative on what option awards there were and qualitative on sort of best practice. And it sort of built out over time until there was a deck and I started sharing that deck out. And then I just thought, well, spoke internally and we said, look, let's actually push this out. It's an ecosystem need. Let's push it out there and get the sort of content marketing benefit for us, frankly, but also really educate the ecosystem because it's to everybody's advantage to do that. So that led to the book uh, and, um, and the uh, option plan app. So what I wanted to do this evening is take you through 16 tips, which is sort of summarized themes from the, from the book um, uh, for designing your stock option plan. Um, and there are 16, so I'll sort of try and whiz through and leave questions until the end, if that's okay. Um, so, just a little bit of background, then we'll get into the tips. So, we, we, we believe that, you know, when we started 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, right, access to capital was the biggest uh, impediment and bottleneck in the European ecosystem. But over the last five years, and particularly the last few years, we've seen... Uh, a huge increase in funding available for startups. Now, it might not feel that way to you, to all of you guys, um, and obviously there's always still the matching issue um, of, of uh, capital finding great entrepreneurs, but compared to five years ago, there is a huge amount more capital available at all stages uh, of growth and scaling for startups. And really the single biggest barrier we think now to successful scaling, uh, and our entrepreneurs constantly tell us this, is very much access to talent. So how do you attract, retain, motivate, and align your team and your top talent, especially when you're competing, uh, particularly on technical talent, but with very much more deep-pocketed uh, deep corporates, uh, the big tech companies, banks, consultancies. How are you going to compete there? You can't compete on pure salary alone. You can't compete on benefits or job security. So how, how are you going to compete? So you've got two secret weapons as a startup. Um, first, obviously, is, is around culture and mission. Um, there's a large proportion of people who don't want to work in a, uh, in a very large, faceless corporate environment or to spend, as you know, one Facebook engineer I know said, like the last 10 years just trying to optimize clicks onto dodgy pieces of newsfeed. Um, you know, there's more to life, there's more missionary things that you can do, and startups absolutely can offer that, and that sense of being a core part of decision making and shaping something special. Uh, the second, though, is financial upside. Um, and you know, we've seen this play out in Silicon Valley. Uh, there's, and it's a huge draw for people, um, that, that potential upside of being in early on something which can grow to be worth a lot more in future. And people will sacrifice uh, current comp, cash comp, uh, in order to, to have that. In, in, and although I stress that's proportional to the maturity of an ecosystem. So that's a key theme, right? There's a chicken and egg thing going on with stock options around, well, if talent doesn't value it, why should I bother giving it? And you have to break out of that cycle to create a virtuous cycle. So um, let's look at some stats here from some analysis that we did. So ESOP, ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Um, so that's like the acronym I'm just going to use to say collectively how much of your company is owned by employees. So ESOP size in Europe is half what it is in the US. I'm out of range. Um, so this is analysis by Funding Round uh, showing the breakdown of ownership of a startup in the US between employees, which are in red, but in white are the founders you guys, and uh, in grey investors. So you can see how that evolves over time as you scale. Um, in the US, the typically you've got a 10% ESOP at seed stage, 
Um, all these charts and everything's in the books, so before anybody tries to sort of scribble anything down, you don't need to. Um, you'll typically start at 10% ESOP at seed, 15% uh, at Series A, and then it will grow over time to 20%, 20% plus as you get to Series D plus. Um, so it's a very significant slug of the company which is owned by employees. Um, in Europe, it pretty much flatlines at about 10%. And I'll add on to that, that it's way more variable, right? In mathematical terms, standard deviation is much, much greater in uh, Europe as well. Uh, yeah, so if the average is 10% and it doesn't really grow, you do a funding round, it dilutes, it's topped back up to 10%. Or that might be at 6% or 5%, or it might sometimes more like uh, in, you know, sort of enlightened or progressive uh, uh, companies, you'll see it at the 12% level or whatever, but it doesn't re very rarely has this sort of shape. Um, so that instantly is a, a major issue. There's just less equity getting to employees. Um, so that's obviously going to impact on the type of talent that we're able to attract and retain. So why is that? Um, well, four key drivers. Um, one is mindset, where it's investors and you know, and entrepreneurs, we collectively have to share responsibility that, that we, have to, we have to break out of a mindset that says this focused on the share of the pie rather than the size of the pie. That's, well, why should I dilute? You know, I'm diluting down my ownership. Um, why should I do that if people aren't absolutely demanding it? Like, this is Europe, it's not the US. Why should I? So we've got to break out of that mindset. Secondly is government policy. And I know we can't change that in this room now, but you know, it, it is slowly changing. These things are changing, but obviously on tax rates is one key area, but it's not just tax rates. It's also uh, uh, impact in terms of like having minority shareholders on the cap table can become a real drag. Uh, it's one of the main reasons why, you know, virtual stock option plans are very common uh, in Germany, for instance, is because it can be a real pain in the neck having to consult with minority shareholders. Um, uh, before you make decisions as a company. Um, third one is risk appetite. So this is the issue on the talent side. If employees don't see the value of them, they're not demanding equity. So it's a, that thing around breaking that cycle. Um, but again, that is changing as well, right? So, you know, an example um, in our portfolio, like when Criteo uh, went public, you know, it's a per Paris... Uh, founded uh, ad tech company, retargeting company. When they went public on uh, New York Stock Exchange, they uh, they instantly overnight created 50 employee millionaires. Right? That's great. Now you see on any cap table in Paris now, there is at least one of those 50, usually multiple of them, who have become angel investors in the ecosystem. And they are drawing in more and more talent into the ecosystem. You're getting that positive buzz of talent. So it comes from exits, successful exits, create successful ex-employees who go on to become either investors, founders, or uh, evangelize for more employees to come into the ecosystem. And the fourth one is around lack of benchmarks. I said at the beginning, it's just in the US, there's pretty available data on like, oh, a, a senior dev at Series A, they should get this much equity. They know it, you know it. So there's not like a massive amount of discussion that's part of the expectation. It's just part of your job offer you know, hey presto, you're done. We don't have that in Europe at the moment. And that's why sort of one of the things trying to set out to change here. So to get cracking into, uh, oh, no, no, there's one slide before we get into the first of the 16 tips. Um, so this is our suggestion looking top down, right? How big should your ESOP be? So we're not suggesting like just, you know, mindlessly f copy what happens in the US. We're not saying that because it wouldn't be appropriate. It has to be a staggered stage thing. But rather than this flatlining 10%, we think that the next generation of European startups, the successful ones, are going to have something more like the red line. So a sort of 12%, 14%, 16% sort of growth in the ESOP as they scale of employee ownership. And if you're doing something which is more deep tech linked, that's going to be higher again. Because obviously the real demand... Uh, on the stock option side is more technical talent where you're really competing m quite nakedly with like the most deep pocketed uh, 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 companies on the planet uh, for that talent. So that's the top down view. Um, oh, I missed one. Oh no, that was the first tip, sorry. Right, second tip, make everyone an owner. Um, we think this is really important. Um, even if you're just giving small amounts of equity, give equity to everybody in the business, at least until your team size is like 150. 
Um, who does that or who's intending to do that at the moment, like as a founder? You know, is that like who's doing that and who isn't? Okay, yeah. So this is like quite a tough message or a different message to give, but we think it's, you know, really important. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a large amount, but making everybody feel properly like part of the undertaking, that you're all in this together. You all have a common shared, not just mission and vision, but also, you know, financial incentives as well uh, are shared. And yeah, you know, it's, it's the stats here um, from the... Uh, uh, analysis analyses that I did. It's only one in three European continental European companies that do this at the moment. It's pretty much de rigueur. I know it says like towards eighty percent in the Bay Area, but it's pretty much one hundred percent. You know this, that that data is a couple of years old. It is pretty much that. Um, three um, up upfront versus delayed grants. So this is a good example from a tip point of view of where not saying do it just the American way. Because in the US, like I said, pretty much everybody you hire, right the way down to an office manager is going to, in the in Silicon Valley, an office manager will say, what stock options am I going to get? And that's absolutely how it is. Just just how it is in the ecosystem. Um, um, and they expect to see that before they sign on the sign up to, to join your company. Um, in Europe, obviously, it's very, very different. We can actually have the benefit of holding off on some roles uh, before giving a sort of fuller grant. So as I said, give something token amount to everybody who joins the company. But in terms of like really chunky amounts of equity, yes, if you're hiring an executive, you're almost definitely going to have to negotiate stock options part of their package before they join at a VP or C-suite level individual. They would expect that. Um, and increasingly, um, engineers, you know, I definitely see this uh, uh, in, in London now, you know, there's... There's a, a large proportion of second generation startup engineers, software engineers, who will be very actively asking, right, what's my auction package going to look like before they sign up, especially early stage. But outside of those groups of execs and, and maybe plus or minus uh, uh, technical team or software engineers, um, you can usually hold off and say, here's a token amount. And you can then assess over the next six or 12 months, what is the actual performance of those individuals? Are those people who are really going to be with you, you know, and you really are going to be critical to the success of the business? Hold off and assess their performance before you grant more. We'll come back to that in a minute. So, right, let's get into actual some numbers and some guidance here. So I said about executive hires. Um, and I don't know if any of you, you know, it's usually, you know, you wouldn't think about hiring non-founding execs until you've raised a Series A uh, in almost all cases. Um, but for some forward guidance here, um, ownership range for you know, C-suite uh, execs, you, you're only talking about a few individuals here, right? You're talking about maximum three individuals who are true C-suite, um, going to be in there in the core decision-making and strategic uh, uh, aspects of the business um, as you scale and saying, roughly speaking, a percent each, right? Might be a little bit less, a little bit more, depending on experience, etc. but roughly speaking, 1%. So, if you had the billion dollar exit, those individuals stand to make $10 million pre-dilution, um, but as a sort of rough number to throw out there. So a real massive life-changing amount. Uh, VP level, as you scale your business through A, B, C round, you're going to build up a suite of sort of five to eight VP level execs as well across different functions. Uh, for those individuals, somewhere between 0.4, 0 0.7%. Usually the more technical roles like a VP product are going to be towards the higher end of that. Um, and something like a VP finance is going to be at the lower end of that. Um, but it also, again, depends on experience, etc. So again, that's a sort of pre-dilution uh, gross amount of 4 to $7 million on your billion dollar exit. Um, so that's on execs. What about the rest of the team then? So tip five. Um, when you're talking about the rest of the team, the best way to express it, I think, is as a percentage of base salary. Because if you start talking about percentage of company for different, these different roles, it becomes, you know, you're getting 0.02% of the business. And they go, way, great. Um, whereas if you express it, actually, you know, you're getting 10 or 15,000 euros worth of stock, it becomes more meaningful. And if you get a 10x you know, increase in valuation on that, it becomes a really serious sum of money. So think of it as sort of money at work rather than as percentage of ownership. 
So these are percentages of salary. Um, this is a nine box grid um, that pulled together. So it breaks down between function and seniority. So seniority on the horizontal, uh, an individual contributor or a senior or experienced individual or maybe a sort of team head and then a director level. Um, and then down uh, vertically, you've got the real the sort of core technical team, uh, engineering product um, and uh, in there. And then you've got in the middle marketing, finance, HR functions and at the bottom, uh, sales, customer success. Um, and usually those get less equity because they're more on variable commission sort of driven compensation plans. Uh, and that's your grid then for uh, a sort of to where to start thinking about as a percentage of ownership um, from, from our perspective. And again, these aren't hard and fast, but it's a starting point. And then you can, you know, your mileage may vary. You can uh, adapt and amend. But that is uh, based on looking at US data, looking at current European data, extrapolating to what we think the next generation of European successful European startups will, will be doing. So if you roll that up, um, those exec level uh, uh, um, awards and the um, others, the rest of the rest of the team, this is like a typical hiring plan that we might see for uh, after Series A, right? So following Series A, 50 hires across those different functions, number of hires, the uh, percentage, and based on like some compensation data, what, how much you're giving away in stock options. So on that, it's between Series A and Series B, $1.6 million, right? So really significant amount. But this is all reflected in the app. If you go to Option Plan, you can start mucking around with all these figures and designing this, and it will tell you exactly how this uh, pans out. So, um, right, this is the maximum complexity I'll get this evening, right? It's, I don't want to turn stock options into rocket science, but um, this is as, as far as I'll go. So we, I gave the baseline awards, like what should you give by function and level? But I also said hold off and see how strong people's performance is and make the awards dependent on performance. So this is about doing that. It's another nine box grid, so you can layer this on top of the other one. So it so basically gives you a multiplier um, on those baseline awards. So here it's, it's a nine box grid based on the contribution that an individual is making today and the contribution that you think the potential they have for the future. So it's a simple low, medium, high on each of those axes. Uh, and I've given these sort of, I, I had fun coming up with these names, these labels. So obviously at the, the top right, you're your superstars, and then you've got your rising stars next to them. Right in the middle there, you've got your reliable contributors. So what we're basically saying is six to 12 months after somebody joins, put them in this grid. Where do you think they are? You can use this for other purposes as well, right? It's sort of, you know, not just for stock options, but sort of, you, you do that. I've also, the figures in red are what, on my experience, um, I see as like the basic breakdown in a typical startup how how would you know how many people what percentage of the team would fall into these different categories and i know it's really hard because generally as a founder you think every member of your team is absolutely awesome uh, and they're all superstars so it takes a bit of sort of stepping back a bit to be objective on this one but um if you do those are the sort of percentage guidelines that's why i give them and then there's multipliers right so the superstars i'm saying look at what those baseline awards are and apply a times two multiplier if somebody's a reliable contributor, then ratchet that down. It might be half as much or it might be nothing, right? It might just be they get their small token amount baseline and you don't go beyond that. Again, this gives you the flexibility depending on what your cap table looks like, what sort of philosophy you have as a founder on this. But the key thing is that if you want to attract and retain and motivate the best people, you can award them and that, this allows you to do that in a, in a way that reflects actual contribution. Right, um, question eight, um, sorry, point eight, um, cash equity trade-off. So this is like another tip. Um, you've got some individuals who are really, you know, either for lifestyle reasons or risk appetite reasons, they are much more focused on the cash component of, of their offer and they're not particularly interested in equity or they're not in a position to give up cash for equity. They might, for family reasons or whatever it is. Um, those other people are much more flexible, they're in different stage of life or whatever, and they really want to double down uh, and they've got that risk appetite. So you can make this an explicit part of you know, your, your um, hiring offers that you say, right, here's the offer, but if you want more equity, you can sacrifice cash 
uh, and get more equity and just build that in. It's explicit, it's transparent, and it allows people to gauge their level of risk um, and, and to benefit. And maybe do it, like I've said, like up to 15% of salary on a sort of one-to-one -one ratio or something. Um, but you can, you can figure out the mechanics of it exactly, what works for you. Um, but it's one way around this issue of why should I give to people who don't really want it. Um, point nine. Sorry, it's like the, the, the slides are getting more and more boring. Um, but uh, um, at least the, hopefully the content's useful. Um, be consistent. Um, I see it too often that uh, uh, you get companies that end up doing a deal for one person and it's different for another. And well, this person, we had to hire them out of this company. Were, and it becomes a, a bit sort of messy. And the point is that people do speak to each other, right? And we all know this. And you don't want to be in a position where you've got an indefensible sort of setup in how you're allocating your comp or your stock options. So the best thing is just don't do that. You know, by, by following the sort of guideline and framework I've set out, you've got a clear, consistent rationale for why you are doing the things you're doing. So even if you choose not to share that and make it completely transparent, and some companies do, right? Some companies like say, this is how much we give. This is what, you know, be totally upfront about it. Uh, and this is how performance will modulate it. That's up to you, right? That's very much a sort of cultural, philosophical thing for you. But at least if you know that you're following a, a sort of quite rigorous methodology, it's defensible and rational if anybody uh, does challenge it. Um, and try and avoid exceptions. Although, obviously, you may always have a reason for an exception. Um, but if there is, again, a defensible reason, like you've got an absolutely shit hot you know, engineer that you can hire out of, you know, Google or whatever, uh, and you really want to bring them in, um, you know, you, if, as long as you feel it's defensible to the rest of the team uh, on this sort of framework, then do it. Um, point 10. Um, now, this, this, this is very much starts to get into what's possible in different geographies. So strike price. Um, the strike price is, then, there is, is how much the person, once you've issued the stock options, what do they have to pay um, to exercise them? Um, in most of Europe, the strike price is pretty much defined by the last round valuation that you had. So whatever the share price was when you last raised money is what you have to issue stock options at. Um, as you go later on, later stage, you could, there's some flexibility around, like if you've got pref prefs, preference shares, when you bring investors in, they'll have prefs, and you can argue for a lower strike price, etc. Where you can do, right, then you'll get some investors who, I don't understand it personally, but they seem to have this sort of view of, no, 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 why should employees have a better share price than I have as an investor? Um, yeah, it's complete nonsense, right? They're <laughs> because investors uh, you know, have a lot more to, to lose and because if those employees feel highly motivated, they can much more actively help the success of the company than you can as an investor, frankly. Um, so get the lowest strike price possible for your, for your employees. Um, this is explicitly possible in the US and the UK where you can actually go to the tax authorities and get an assured valuation. It's one of the changes that we'd like to see in elsewhere in Europe. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got, you know, separate to this sort of project and the entrepreneur outreach is a separate thing of trying to do outreach to government as well to try and change policy on, on around stock options. So we'll keep working on that and please get involved and help uh, as well. Um, but yeah, be as generous as you can on strike price. Um, this one, I'm really, yeah, it's really close to my heart. Uh, I sort of feel this very, very strongly. Uh, and it, again, it, it can come up as a sort of surprise to a lot of uh, investors or entrepreneurs, like, be generous to leavers. Like, why should we? They're leaving. Why the hell should we be generous to them? Um, and I don't know, I, I, like, I don't have a perfect, like, massive uh, amount of data on this, but from the data I do have, I sort of, it seems to be this is, a particular issue in Germany as well, that levers uh, in Germany often, because there's often the virtual stock option schemes, as obviously you'll be aware, that part of the virtual stock options pro plan is, is you know, some of the standard wording is that if you leave, you, you lose everything. You don't have the right to exercise and exercise to hold a, 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 a virtual stock, right? You've got the virtual stock option, then you leave uh, and you lose it all. Now, you know, the, the point is that if you're going to get build a really successful business, it is a 10, 12-year journey from founding to IPO, 
it's a multi-billion dollar IPO, right? And I don't say that lightly, right? Because, you know, we have seen like 15, 20 of those at index over the years, and those are the ones that give us our knockout return. So I'm not saying that glibly. I'm saying that very much from a sort of informed perspective. Um, but very few, if you look at your team, your first 20 employees, only one or two of those individuals are going to be there at the point that you IPO, right? That's the reality. They will leave before. Um, and... They, but through that time, they might have been with you and be fully vested. They might have been with you for years, from really early days, pulling in blood, sweat, and tears, and working those long hours. And then they leave, and suddenly, often they don't realize it until they leave. And then they leave, and they go, what? I got nothing. I'm going to get nothing. It's like, I feel like, you know, leavers exercising their options is a great outcome. It's a vote of confidence in your company. They become great ambassadors for your talent brand, and they will evangelize and say, this is a good company to work for. If they leave feeling, I've put all that blood, sweat, and tears in, I took a pay cut to join the company, I sacrificed several years of my life, and I've got nothing, they're going to feel really crap about you. They're not going to be ambassadors. Uh, and on an ecosystem level, that plays out over hundreds and hundreds of startups, and those people will not join another startup, and you will kill the ecosystem. So I feel this is like really, really important. And you know, see that in ecosystems, you know, sort in Silicon Valley and then you know elsewhere in the US and seeing it in London, th those second, third generation of startup employees. Uh, and it's because of having had successful outcomes. Uh, and usually they've been leavers, right? But they've been able to exercise. Uh, this also goes hand in hand, by the way, with the strike price thing, right? Because if you're a lever, you have to pay to exercise. If the strike price is high, you have to put hard cash on the table to exercise. And that's often the reason why employees won't exercise, because it's like, well, I have to pay out like 5,000 euros cash to do it? That's a big ask, right? So, but then you can get uh, imaginative, right? You can, uh, you can extend the exercise period. You can say, you don't have to pay it all now. You can pay it over the next few years. Like I've seen companies, you know, it's pretty common in the US to now to extend the exercise period by a year for each year of service of the employee, right? So they don't have to pay it immediately. It's not the traditional US one, which was exercise in 19 days or you lose it all. Um, and, uh, or you can have a situation where you retain that vested stock, but you can't exercise it until the point of exit. Now that's very generous, but it is actually, it's not uncommon in Europe, right? Because, because of the issue in Europe of having, um, minority shareholders, if somebody does exercise and they become a minority shareholder and then it becomes an administrative headache. So you do get European companies that do retain but don't exercise. But I think the ideal is just having an extended exercise period. Or the best is such a low strike price, which um, I don't want to sound UK-centric when I live in the UK, but like strike prices in the UK are generally 80-90% uh, discounted off the last round valuation. So like when I was at uh, my last startup before I was at Index, when I left, you know, I had you know, not a massive amount of stock, but it cost me like 50 pounds to exercise it, right? It's a no-brainer. So everybody then, and now I'm a shareholder and I'm really, you know, plugged into the success of the business and I'll do what I can to help them, uh, e even now. So, so that was a lot on that one. I told you I felt strongly about it. Um, right, tip 12. Um, accelerated vesting. Now we're getting into some real quite technical. I, uh, I mean, just 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 so I can gauge for future times when I give this talk, is this just going to go to over everybody's heads if I'm start talking about accelerated vesting? Like, just be honest so that I know I can cut the slide. No, nope. or does it make sense to talk about it? All right, good. Sorry, because I said hold off to questions till the end. It's really hard for me to gauge whether people are falling asleep or this is useful. Um, accelerated vesting is, is around what happens if you have a change of control. Generally a trade sale, maybe an IPO. But at the point of a trade sale, what happens to unvested options? Um, so I, it was really interesting, actually, when I did the survey for this uh, piece of work, and I compared practice in the US and Europe. It was really different on this one, because in most things, the European startups were really much more sort of stingy than the US, um, uh, for want of a better word. But on this one, it was a, a good, over a third of the European startups offered all employees acceleration uh, at the point of an exit. So if you had any invested stock, it would just all vest and uh, become available. Right? I mean, when the, even, even in, within the index team, we were like, what? And it would be unheard of to do this on a, in the US. Absolutely unheard of. Um, why? Because it creates almost like a poison pill for an acquirer. Um, you're basically telling to a trade buyer, 
uh, that at the point that they purchase the business, where a very significant part of the valuation is based on the team that they're acquiring, that the whole team is going to make potentially a significant amount of money and might walk out the door. Um, it's not, you know, the point is, as the quote there says, um, you know, it's not the end of the road for the acquirer. It's the beginning of the journey, not the end of the journey. Uh, so y we'd sort of say that is not a good idea to put acceleration, um, accelerated vesting in place. Um, if you're giving a good stock allocations up front with good terms, like I've been outlining, then you don't need acceleration to make this great sweetener like, da -da, it's, now we all can make some money. You do it progressively as you go along and you treat uh, an exit as a next stage in the life of the company, not as the end of the life of the company. Um, right, being really, really getting very wonkish about it, right? What we recommend is double trigger acceleration for the entire leadership team, right? So that basically means if there is an exit that... Um, there is the the unvested stock only gets accelerated if um, if effectively the, uh, that individual is fired without cause after the acquisition. This is like think of it like a CFO, right? The CFO is intimately involved in doing the deal to be acquired. They get uh, they, they 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 have to work. 24-7 on making that deal happen, but they're the most likely person after the acquisition to get fired. Um, it's not a great sort of incentive um, matching. Thus, uh, having a sort of acceleration, double trigger acceleration for individual in that role makes a lot of sense. Right, um, tip 13. Right, refreshers. So again, this is like looking to the future. Right? These are slightly more on the horizon from uh, where most of you will be. But you know, you'll be thinking about initial grants, and we've talked mostly about um, initial grants. But as you scale, it's a long journey. Um, you need to retain those key people as you scale. So on a typical four-year vesting, um, uh, vesting schedule for, for stock options, offer a refresher grant at the point of like two and a half, latest three years. Don't get to the point where you're at effectively the last year cliff where people can see that they're nearly fully vested and their eyes start to wander and they start to think about other things. So to keep them locked in to think of it selfishly um, and feeling like there's more skin in the game for them uh, in your company. And try and introduce a sort of standard sort of program. It tends to be very ad hoc until you get to real scale. And Every company I've ever spoken to on this, and yeah, that's a quote from uh, Peter Campbell from Mimecast, uh, another of our companies. Like this is, I always hear this. It's like I wish we'd put in place a, a sort of more standard uh, approach to refresher grants earlier in the day because um, we just did it ad hoc and we lost a lot of good people. Um, but you don't have to do this for everybody, right? You don't have to offer like think about that performance grid that I shared with you earlier. Just think that like maybe it's the top 20% or top 40 or 50% of, of employees who you really want to keep and target your refresher grants to those individuals. Um, and in terms of like what size should it be, um, I think that the, the, basic, the basic approach would be what's, um, uh, what would you have to hire that person for now? What would you have to offer them or what would you be willing to offer that person if you are hiring them new into the company now and use that as the way of driving what uh, what grant they should give, and you can use the uh, the grids from earlier. By the way, the grids from earlier with the um, percentages for execs and for uh, and for different other people in the in the company, I've like tested that model out through a notional Series A, Series B, and Series C, and the, the math works, right? So you can continue using that those sort of percentages all the way through. Um, you don't have to. It's not something you have to change each time as you scale. Um, it, it works because the valuation goes up and it just adjusts itself, which I was very happy to see when that happened. Um, so <laughs> this is really sad. This is almost like confessional, isn't it? You can imagine the hours, like <laughs> feeling like mini fist pump. <laughs> um, right, so that's on re refreshers. You don't have to, by the way, because I, I have been asked this, you can, you can agree the deal, what the refresher is, um, at the two and a half year mark. It doesn't mean that you kick it in then. It's not like the person has two different schemes vesting at the same time. You basically put it in place and you say there's a cliff to time at the, when, the, when the first cycle ends, the second cycle kicks in straight away. So it's like an extension really. Um, but one of the issues with offering refreshers, particularly you know, think of the people who you might have hired in early, who you might have given 
sort of significant option grants to really early on at really low valuation. Now, if you fast forward and you we're all obviously going to build incredibly successful businesses, and in four years' time, you've you've raised your Series B at you know a 200 million valuation. Um, now, almost any amount of equity of stock options that you give for those individuals at a 200 million valuation are going to be worth a tiny fraction of what their initial grant was going to be. So, I do moderate the refreshers thing by saying, get real, right? Are you better? Are you best? Is it best to deploy that precious resource of stock options? to those really early employees who've already got a lot of skin in the game or to new hires um, who, who, who don't have that early uh, low priced equity. So do think about that. And the way around that is the next tip, nice segue, right, uh, around secondary sales. So again, yeah, I'm forwarding several years into the future, right? But you sort of, you're raising now maybe like your Series B or whatever, and um, you've been going for you know, four or five years. And um, you've got people who are fully vested. Now, as I said, it's a really long journey to a really highly valuable exit. And that long journey, it's, it's difficult. People's stages in life change, right? They start off, they join you as sort of young, free, and single. And then they settle down, and they get married, and they have kids. And suddenly, they want to buy a flat. And you know, they can't do it because uh, you know, all their wealth is tied up in stock options. So it's incredibly motivational if you can offer a way for those people to cash in uh, some portion of their stock options, and you know, which which is way over, uh, exceeds the you know the argument that says oh well they're going to be less motivated because they've got less equity. Well, no, um, I would say no because they'll see it, it visibly demonstrates the value of the equity that's still on the table. That if you allow them to release some, and they'll feel super grateful to you for the for the chance. Obviously, this is a nice problem to have, right? It means that you have to have excess investor demand for your equity when you go out to fundraise, right? But if you do, if you've got that excess demand, then offer it, right? So, you know, I've given some sort of general guidelines around there. Um, you know, limit it to 25% of the vested options. Maybe as a limit, no, no individual can take out more than $100,000 or whatever, so that there's still, like, that motivation for them to stay in. Um, uh, I'd say one thing. Yeah, if we, one thing which makes us wince as investors, and it makes you really go, hmm, about a founder, is founders who say, well, I want secondary, but I don't want anybody else in my team to have it. Right? Just warning sign. It sort of doesn't. Yeah, you've got to take your. You've got to feel like you're in it with your team. If you are going to take secondary out, then open it up to everybody who's been part of that journey with you. So I feel like I'm a bit, it might be a bit holier than now, but. I, just sort of feel, I, I think there's a lot of nods around the room. So I think there's like people that agree on these points, which is, is good to see. Um, right. 15. Um, right, about celebrating your steam uh, without hyping it. You know, there's, there's all this effort you can go into on the mechanics and maths of figuring out who should get this much, da 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 da. One of the issues, particularly in Europe, but even in the US, is that people don't understand stock option schemes, right? So you can offer all these things, but they just don't get it. So they almost discount it. So it's like, that's pointless. So you've put as much energy into the educational uh, aspect of your scheme as into the mechanics, right? Um, so you should, you know, you're giving up precious equity in your company for stock options. So make the most of it, really leverage um, the effect it's going to have, the effectiveness. So you should have definitely with executive hires, you should be having one-on-one -on -one sessions to really go through in detail how the plan works, what the upside might look like, etc. You should do the same with people who are your top performers. Those people are getting the, you know, the extra grants because they're your superstars or people who've been promoted internally and you give them a top-up grant or whatever to recognize that. One-on-one -on -one sessions, really make them feel good. This is a massive chance to recognize their contribution and to build them in and bind them in saying, you know, this is a special, you know, you're, you're super important to the company and we want to recognize that. Um, for other employees, obviously, you can't do that one-on-one -on -one session with every single individual as you, as you scale. So then you can have sort of group sessions or whatever. But just assume that employees don't know anything about it. Right, just even at quite senior levels, um, you know, people uh, tend to not know much about stock options. The key thing to make it to, to, to say is that there's no risk. 
right? This isn't some funny scheme. It's not like by signing, signing up or by having stock options that there's any downside risk. There is zero downside risk. Make that really clear to people, right? It's only upside. Um, but at the same time, don't overhype it. You know, be realistic. You can give them a range of scenarios, like if we exited it this much, that much, or that much, but don't just show the sort of billion dollar valuation sort of exit scenario because you know, if you aren't aiming on that trajectory, you don't get to that trajectory, you'll get disillusioned individuals. So show it, you know, that they're sharing in that risk profile with you. Um, right, a final one was around, mention the book. So that goes into a lot more detail on all of these points. Um, and there's PDF version uh, or, or just sort of downloadable version available at indexventures.com slash rewarding talent. Um, and our op the option plan app is also there, uh, which is a good cue for cheesy music. Um, I've got a, got a video for the option plan app. Um, right, hang on, let me fill the screen. Oh, it's the screen's doing funny things. I want to make it as big as possible, but I can't. All right. Cheesy. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that was like, I'm really, really impressed with the app, actually, the designers created, because it was just a sad looking spreadsheet that I'd built, and they turned into something that looked really beautiful and sexy and fantastic. Um, but uh, hopefully it is actually a very useful, usable tool that all of you can actually play around with, and it can be part of the workflow when you're thinking about um, uh, designing an option plan and you're projecting. It, it's designed for post-series A, um, Obviously, I expect the majority of you are pre-Series A, but there is also a whole chapter on like what you do at pre-Series A and what sort of allocations you should give. In the same way I covered in, in the in the presentation, there, there's like what should you be, how should you be thinking about allocations to those very first individuals before you've raised an institutional round as well. So that's all covered in there as well. Um, and I would say, look, you know, do play around with it, and you can export the results when you when you've done it. And um, uh, always looking for feedback. So, you know, definitely like reach out. Want to try and want this to be a living thing that can be useful for the whole ecosystem. So I'm intending to sort of refresh the data and update it, you know, annually. Uh, add more countries into the country listings and other ways. We've got a bit of a, a roadmap basically in treating it as a bit of a product, a sort of open source product um, project. So very, very much. Uh, looking for feedback from the ecosystem to help do that. Okay. All right. Um, all right. <laughs> questions? Do you want to take questions? Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Hi. Really insightful, really actionable. Um, so if you would, didn't get offered, if an employee doesn't get offered the uh, shares when getting hired, when is the another opportunity, or, or when can you or this person bring up the conver like the conversation, or is this train already lost? Um, no, not at all. I, I I don't think it's ever too late to to raise this topic. As I said, I think in there's a real benefit we have in Europe that people don't demand stock options on the day they're hired or before they sign up, um, and that's really beneficial. So you can really see who who who's going to make a difference to the company, and if they are, then yeah, once you're clear about that and you're, you know, you're you're confident that they they you want them with, with you for the for the long term, yeah, go and just reach out to them as an individual, and say, look, want to give you something, want to want you to be here for the long term, and want to offer you a, a be, become an owner in the business to make that happen. And this uh, comes from the employer, from the employee. Yeah, if it's coming from, I mean, I think it's way better if it's coming 
proactively from the from the, from you as the founder or the or the employer than the employee asking for it. I think that the employee is much more likely to just say, "Well, they obviously don't care about me much, and they'll just leave," um, rather than asking you. Uh, so yeah, be proactive. Show show it as a sign of like your leadership that you know you you want to sort of want them to be part of the team. Cool. Thanks. Did I understand it correctly? That in the UK, you usually grant an 80 to 90 percent discount on the last relation on the strike price. Yes. What will happen in Germany if I would do the same? For example, last relation 20 million, and I grant to my employee a strike price of nominal. Um, I think there'd be a big tax hit. You would have to pay taxes directly, yeah. right? Like a million yeah, or something. Yeah, it would be considered tax based in tax based compensation. So in Germany, it's not possible. No, not currently. Um, you you can't you can't discount on that basis. Um, uh, the I mean because they're virtual, right? You, you know most of the schemes here, right? Eighty ninety percent of schemes, sure. as far as I can tell, uh, on a limited sample size, are, are virtual plans in in Germany. Um, I'm not exactly sure how the tax would work out on that, yeah. right? You have to take more specific advice than I'm willing to give in a public forum <laughs> on tax. <laughs> then uh, one question on that. So, and uh, as we assume, we have like a journey of six, seven years to go. How would I solve the um, bad evangelist problem if uh, the employer would have actually to hold it? You would have a, like a strike price of 500 shares times 100,000 per share. And if he leaves like before we exit, you will get nothing. Is it solvable in Germany at all? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think yeah, absolutely is solvable. Um, th the solution is that your virtual plan should, rather than saying when you leave, your virtual stock options are just dissolved, it says that your vested virtual stock options okay. are retained. You can either make them exercisable, that the person, the individual has to put money in, in order to exercise, or you just say that they are retained until the point of exit. Um, or some combination therein, right? You can, it's a virtual plan, you can be imaginative on that. You could say, like I said, <coughs> that you can pay the exercise price, a notional exercise price based on the notional valuation for with, in, within 12 months, or you can just say they're retained. Okay, so maybe just one more exactly yeah. to that. So for example, it would be something like a secondary then, right? Yeah. And uh, for example, if I make five million profit and then make a secondary of one million, what would be your view as an institutional investor into my company on this kind of move? What you mean, five million fundraise rather? No, than I have five million profit, for example. Operating and then profit. I'll, yes, in profit. Yeah. And uh, for example, then I will, I would want to give like one million as a secondary trade, as a secondary deal to to my employee who's leaving the company. What would be your take on that? What would be your view? What would you recommend to me as a? I think what you're investor? implying there is it's a share buyback. Right, so you've got cash yes. and you want to buy back shares from employees as secondary. I suppose I would, I mean, I would just be questioning whether, you know, your cash, you know, saying bring other, bring external investors in to, to do the secondary because you want to use your cash to grow the business more. You know, if you're, if you're that successful, keep growing, right? Keep investing, reinvesting your cash. You know, buy, buy share buybacks are what you do when you're a more mature company and you've got more cash than you can really deploy uh, effectively in the business. When you're a, if you're a you know, fast growing startup, you shouldn't have that issue probably. You've probably got good uses for capital. Okay. Does that make sense? And very quickly, just with regard to um, secondary sales and the tax exemptions that you mentioned, do they um, still bear fruit in, with regard to a sale at uh, a secondary or is it just a primary exit? Um, in the UK or are you yeah. talking about elsewhere? In, yeah, sorry, in the UK. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 basically they'd be taxed at ten percent flat rate, ten percent tax. Thanks. Okay. Um, but the thing is that, that actually there are now. Um, I was looking at the stats. There are over. It's hard to estimate exactly, but the stats suggest there's somewhere between up to about ten thousand individuals now who've benefited on an average of an average. So these are non-founders an average of £50,000 per person average, about 10,000 people have benefited from stock options, from that stock option program in the UK uh, over the last like five years. So you just think about the momentum that that builds up 
those are quite nice amounts of money that really sort of sucks in talent into the startup ecosystem and that's what you want to do in your ecosystem is build that momentum okay I have two short comprehension questions. One was, I think it was on p point number three, the upfront granting. Um, of course, that still means that the program would be with vesting and everything, right? I mean, if you grant, if you're talking about upfront grants, right? Yeah. And then question number two was on point number nine, you said be consistent. Does that also include showing people where they are on your little matrix, basically, <laughs> or? I said, I mean, being, being consistent partly is about, um, it's about uh, defensibility in your own mind or in the in the management team that you have got a rational way of making these decisions and it can't be so it avoids accusations of favoritism or whatever so part of it is that and it keeps you true you know your true north how transparent you want to be with the wider team it varies a lot right so like um, you know Captain Train which we were invested in uh, in Paris um, yeah, they had radical transparency on their stock range. It was all on their website. You know, it's like, this is how much everybody will be getting. You know, this is how we calculate it. And it was totally there in black and white for everybody to see. And that was part of their culture, right? And that was led by the founder and said, this is how I want to run the business. So it's, it's a philosophical sort of choice, really. But this is more about individual performance over time and, and yeah. how you rate their potential for performance also, which okay. is quite... Okay. Uh, well, that's, I mean, yeah, that's a broader issue of performance management systems, right? And there's a, there's different schools of thought on how transparent or not you are. And I've got a point of view on that, but... Again, please share. <laughs> no, I mean, I think if, if in terms of simply saying uh, my, 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 my sense, and you've got HR folks who, you know, have pathetic little wars between each other on, 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 on their view on this, whether you quantify performance and share that or whether you just keep it qualitative. I personally think it's good to have it qu quantitative, but I think if it's simply a three-point thing of like you're below expectation, you're on expectation or you're above expectation, I think that three, three, three sort of score system, if, if an employee doesn't know where they are between those three points, something is majorly wrong in the way you're managing that person so if you've got a system that forces you to be explicit about are you above or below what expectations are i think that's only a positive thing to to do and anyway, that's a very Thanks. different sort of point but it does relate hey dom thanks a lot for sharing all this um what's your experience with uh, founding members who buy themselves into the team. I have a situation where an angel investor doesn't just want to be an investor, but actually a founding team member. And uh, I wonder if you have any cases um, like that you encountered like that. Um, are, are they going to, you know, do you think that they would be a great addition to the team? That's the thing I don't really know, but I was wondering if I should just say that he can really jump in if he invests a lot of money and <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> I, I would probably separate out the sort of role as an investor from the role as an employee, right? I, I think if you start muddying those waters, you're going to come uh, get into problems down the line. Uh, so I think, you know, you want to have two different roles. You want to buy in as an investor, fine, you've got that investor hat on, but as an employee, I would still grant that person then stock options as a separate thing and keep the two very, very distinct um, uh, and then assess whether they'd be a great person in the team and what their performance is independently of their role as, a, as an investor. I, I don't muddy those waters, would be my advice. Right. Thanks a lot. Okay. I'm trying to think if, I, if there are any specific situations like that I've come across. But. Thank you. Um, very, very insightful talk. Um, a quick question. You mentioned it's very smart to modulate grant size by performance. How do you communicate that best in the hiring process? Um, I, 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 would, I would be, I mean, again, a lot of these things I'm going to throw back just saying it's the philosophy, you know, what you have as a founder uh, and what philosophy you want. I'd be fairly straightforward about that. I'd sort of, you know, as I said, I think, it's tipping points and the tipping point uh, on, on, on technical roles, right? Uh, I think, you know, the US definitely has and the UK is probably past the tipping point where you were, you, for, for engineers and any technical roles, you have to give them up front. It's too core a part. You'll get 
a, a significant portion of individuals, if you're hiring them for technical roles, who will say, what's my stock option grant? So rather than having some of them getting it up front and others not, just say all technical roles, they get it up front. But I don't know if we're at that tipping point in Berlin yet. I mean, I don't know if anybody's got a view on that, but are, are, a, are a significant proportion of, of engineers that you speak to saying, what options am I going to get? Is that a show of hands? Actually, is that is that are you seeing that? No, because I'd say it's 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 probably close to fifty percent. I'd say in the UK, and once you're at that level, you've got to say be consistent. I'd say the consistency argument trumps. So that's on the technical roles, which tends to be a majority early on. But in terms of other roles, then if you're saying it, it's hold off, well then. If, if, if technical people, if engineer, engineers aren't asking for stock option grants up front, it's very unlikely that other people are expecting them or demanding them up front. Mm -hmm. So you then have purely the choice of whether you say, I'm going to assess performance and you may get stock options, or you don't say anything about that and it becomes a nice surprise, mm -hmm. an un, unexpected surprise. I sort of quite like the latter actually, mm -hmm. and is you're less a hostage to fortune that way. And would you keep uh, stock options separate from other, for example, sales incentives, or would you actually sort of link the two? Um, well, insofar as it reflects, you know, if somebody's getting high sales commissions because they're a high performer, the two are correlated. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would create a cause out causal linkage, um, uh, but, but the two will be correlated, right? If you're performing well in a sales role, you're going to be getting good commissions and then you're going to get stock options as well. But I keep, yeah, yeah. But it's just correlative. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say if you hit your commission goal for three months go in a row that you're going to get these stock options. I'd keep it a little bit more broader, holistic assessment of performance. Actually, my question fits very uh, well in this. Um, it's about advisors. How would you compensate advisors? All right, yeah, good one. Um, it's, um, well, you can... You've got more latitude for doing it the same way, probably in Germany, compared to uh, US or UK, because you're usually using virtual plans. It, you, you're not most most stock option plans, most formal in, um, stock option plans. You can't grant; they're employee only. You can't give them to advisors. So you have to have a separate type of scheme for advisors. Um, typically, those those may well be RSUs, restricted stock units which is what you find in bigger companies like Google and Facebook and stuff, they issue uh, or uh, uh, RSUs rather than stock options. Um, so with, with advisors, um, you could give them virtual stock in, in, in the German context generally. Um, and uh, in terms of the amounts, it's much more fuzzy, right? Because there's advisors and there's advisors. It's not like you know, a senior salesperson or a, a financial controller. The, the role of an advisor can be very, very broad, so I can't stick a thing on there just saying it is going to be this much. Um, but having said that, advisory roles um, that I've seen, you know, it, it varies by stage. And if you've got like an amazing advisor very early on who's going to put a lot of time in and will lend their brand equity Uh, to sort of show credibility for you, your company, that's worth a lot. If it's somebody who's much more, you know, less involved or wants to be working behind the scenes, it's, it's, it's got less value. So it could be, you know, they could be remunerated with a, you know, a reasonable amount uh, of equity if they're really putting that time, uh, time and uh, experience into it. Does that make sense? It could be like 0.2, 0.3% potentially at the high end, but... Not yeah. You know, in terms of like later on, like a non-exec role, you often find that comes in at about a point point two percent stake, right? But that's a formal legal relationship. But that often typically has like a point one five point two percent of equity associated with it. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I wondered if there is a rule in the U.S. or in the U.K. that you could say that uh, the ESOPs costs or the the stock options costs will actually always be born pro rata by all the shareholders in the company, I th um, which would mean that there would be no discussion between founders and investors who will bear the cost in the end, because this is always a topic in financing route in, in Germany. For the strike price cost, you mean? Or no, 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 no. Uh, oh, who pays? Sorry, who dilutes? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's always a topic, right? It is always a topic. Um, 
And yeah, obviously, yeah, I'm 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 not going to beat around the bush. There's a direct um, there's a direct tension between entrepreneur and investor here, right? Everything I've said this evening, I can say hand on my heart that we're investors, but we don't mind diluting for the ESOP and blah blah blah. And it's absolutely true. But obviously, in any given round, who's paying is uh, a negotiation and, and discussion point, right? Does the entrepreneur dilute their share? Does the investors dilute their share? Is it pre-money, post-money? Obviously, any investor, if you go on to raise more money, they're going to be in your position and they're going to be diluted as well, right? But in the actual live round, it's, uh, it's, it's an argument, right? And almost any VC is going to start off by saying you as the entrepreneur should bear the dilution cost, or, or the, the pre-existing shareholders, including the entrepreneur, should, 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 um, uh, uh, should bear that cost. But if you've got a competitive range of term sheets in front of you, you can start negotiating. And I'm not going to say anything more than that, otherwise I'll get in trouble. <laughs> cool. OK, time for two more questions. There's one over here, and then. Uh, quick additional question to the advisor question. Yeah. Um, for very, very early stage startup, before any kind of investments, if, if I'm trying to bring on advisors, do you still suggest it's be like 0.1 to 0.2% equity given to the advisor? I mean, the same, the same sort of parameters apply, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how much money they're putting in, how much, yeah, how much, sorry, time they're putting in, uh, how experienced they are, how, how much value you think they're really gonna uh, to bring. So there isn't a formula, almost anything when you're in super early stage, is much more art than science. It was easy for me to write this book once we're in Series A and beyond because it becomes a bit more scientific. Uh, you guys, most of you will know, it's much more an art <laughs> when you're pre-A because it's so it, it's so unvalidated. You don't have those external valuation points and things to really say this is real money rather than funny money. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so so it, it is an art, um, and yeah, I mean it could be that. Uh, you know, it, it it is it could be anywhere on a range from, like from zero to, I don't know, to to point four point five. If somebody was amazing and they were really gonna, you might make that contingent, right? If they were like helping open up conversations with fund fund with investors and helping really in the fundraising side and stuff as well, yeah, they might be worth more, right? So it's it's uh it's it's, it's hard for me to say beyond that, right? Hey, yeah. Um, how does everything you said today uh, um, transfer to the blockchain space, where you don't have a <laughs> serious and the IPO at the end, but you have a lot of money right up front from an ICO, for example? I should have been prepared for this question, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm not. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know in terms of like, you know, ICOs and stock options. I mean, look, the same thing, the same basic rules apply that if employees have to believe that what they're getting has got some real potential value, right? If they, if you can demonstrate that, that it's not just smoke and mirrors and it's not something that can be taken off the table, that there's something real in it, then it will have the same motivating uh, effect. And if it's, in, and, and, and if, you know, on, on fundamentals, if it's enough that you can raise funds from investors, then that should be good enough to convince employees but you know in terms of like your terms you still the same things apply like what happens if I leave what happens with dilution all those same parameters apply uh, so I don't I don't think it you know I haven't thought it through entirely but I don't think it should change fundamentally the way you do it but you you I don't know if you could have the same legal structure of uh, like in you know you're, you're you've got the freedom of a virtual stock option plan usually in Germany so you can do what you want I don't know if you could apply, uh, I don't think you could do a crypto stock option plan in the US <laughs> yet. Who knows, it might change soon. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it was awesome. Um, I know it changes for, for every company, but I was just wondering if you have any kind of guide for entrepreneurs and companies raising money, how much equity they should expect to give away at you know, Angel, Seed, Series A, and what they should expect to own. Uh, as a company coming into like Series A or Series B? Um, um, there was the chart that I put up 
earlier, which showed the sort of, on average, what the ownership structure is. Uh, and it, it shows what the, on average, in US data, what the founder, uh, how that founder equity sort of dilutes on average. And I, I sort of modeled it out, and that's fairly, it, it, it holds true with like, I, I had a range of sort of um, average valuations that I was using for my Series A, Series B, Series C, right? And it's sort of, you know, a, a, a Series A at a 20 million pre-money, a Series B at a 100 million pre-money, 250 at a Series million, Series C. So I sort of did it on those basis, and it matched pretty much accurately with what the overall stats that I was getting from my US data source were. Um, I, can, I can just put it on screen so you can see it. It's in the book as well. Um, okay. It's in the book, but... I know, I was, I was quite, I'm pleased that you asked that actually because I thought that that was a, a really interesting chart in its own right, nothing to do with stock options. Um, and I thought, oh, it's going to be hidden on like page 37 or something and um, uh, no, you, know, you won't see it, but it's interesting. So here, yeah, like, so obviously you start off 100% um, seeds, seed stage or post seeds 75%, uh, series A just under 40%, uh, series B, 28, 29%, 20% Series C, and 10% Series D. But that's like, yeah, a typical Series D uh, in an index company is 500 million valuation. So that's like a 50 million ownership stake you've got. So, you know, it might only be 10%, but I'm not, you know, you don't have to cry for those founders. Um, they're not going to be going, going poor. Um, so, yeah, so there is that dramatic, dramatic dilution. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, is this, does that match? Is that surprising, those stats, to anybody here? Or is that pretty much what you sort of, you know, have seen before or thought? But, I mean, it is, it is interesting how, yeah, you drop below majority stake at Series A almost always. You know, unless you're like a, you know, a Mark Zuckerberg, you're going to be in a situation where you're, you're, you're going to be, but you're still, still going to be the single biggest shareholder by a long, a large margin. Okay. Thanks a lot for the insights, Tom. Good luck on the lead.